Associate Professor of Human Geography from the University of Lund, uh, Agnes Andersson Jurfeld. She is a member of the Siani Network, and we are happy to have her here today to discuss her long-running research since 2001, I think, in smallholder productivity in agriculture and how she thinks food security can be achieved in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Agnes. <coughs> I was supposed to wave to someone. Oh, I waved <laughs> to get the, the the sound. Thank you. Um, I'm very delighted to be here, uh, and I was very interested to hear um, uh, Marianne Gio's presentation of the recommendations. I think to start off with, I'll say that I think one of the um, uh, very positive things about the recommendations is that they put the smallholders in focus, and I think that's a, a welcome change. For earlier policies. Um, I should also start out by saying that uh, I'm here as a researcher, so I'll be presenting uh, my uh, reactions to the report and the Commission's recommendations on the basis of my research and the research that I've been carrying out. So I'm not representing civil society or the donors and so on. Um, as Melinda said, I'm Agnes anderson Jurfeldt. I come from Lund University from the Department of Human Geography. Um, and I work uh, on basically food, secu food security among smallholders in uh, nine different African countries using uh, a mixed methods approach, um, combining qualitative and quantitative methods. I have a strong interest not only in food security, but also in gender issues tied to smallholder agriculture in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'll pick up on uh, Gunilla's, uh, Gunil, sorry, uh, point about um, the whole concept of sustainability. And I think we can talk in one respect of ethical sustainability when it comes to food security and food insecurity. It's a deeply ethical issue um, in terms of how to fight hunger, starvation and malnutrition. And it needs to be part of the sustainability concept, I think. So. I think before we start considering the hows, which is very much what this report is about, or the recommendations, we need to consider the whys. Why are we doing this? Why are we interested? And to start off with, I'd, I'd, I'd start by arguing that it's, it's an ethical issue um, in the sense that these deep, this deep-set inequality that characterizes um, the global food system today that Marion outlined, so I won't say more about that. It's also an economic and ethical issue in the sense that how to encourage growth that reduces poverty. So not only how do we fight food ins or f um, how do we accomplish food security, but how do we encourage growth that has uh, uh, positive effects on, on poverty reduction. Um, and there's a big body of research that looks on the links between agriculture and its poverty reducing effects. So I, I, I'll just mention that. But in the context of Africa, it's also a political and deeply practical issue, uh, which perhaps we tend to forget about sometimes. And that's how to feed growing cities when the countryside cannot feed itself, as it is today. Now, Africa's um, urban areas today comprise about 37% of the population, or they hold about th around between 35 and 40% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa. By 2050, they're projected to hold about 57%. I checked the uh, UN um, population um, pr um, prospects yesterday. Um, so it's, it's a practical issue in, in a whole set of ways. And the other practical issue arises from uh, the era of cheap food imports being um, believed, most commentators, is, is believed to be over. So we have a situation of where cities and urban areas, basically non-agrarian pursuits are growing quite rapidly, but um, the option of feeding growing urban populations through cheap food imports is shifting um, also. <coughs> and this uh, means that there is this practical impetus to solving these issues also. So as I said, rural Africa contains about 65% uh, of Africa's population. Um, and in some respects, uh, also 
from the pragmatic point of view, these are the people who should be in focus. Most of them uh, earn a living as smallholder farmers, growing mainly food crops, grains, tuber staples, mostly for subsistence. And there is a strong overlap between poverty and rurality in the sense that most of Africa's poor live in the rural areas. Um, as part of the, the food price crisis of 2008, there was, um, of, of course, urban food riots and so on, and there was a rise in, in urban poverty also. So we, we, we cannot forget about that part, but nonetheless, there is a strong overlap. Um, Livelihoods in the rural areas are b mainly agriculture-based, uh, and they are agriculture-based, but production is largely disconnected from global food systems in the sense that um, they're not selling to a world market. There's a lot of discussion about how to engage smallholder farmers with, with global markets, but for most uh, African food producers or smallholder food producers, the global market is is very distant in terms of, of their own marketing strategies, hitting the global market. However, um, since many tend to be net consumers of food rather than net producers, that is, they need to buy some of their food requirements, they're connected indirectly as consumers to the global world market. So that means they're susceptible to import prices, <coughs> especially of, of foods, uh, food staples. And in this sense, there are two key ways of improving food security in rural areas. One is to enable um, smallholder producers to produce more food to be able to feed themselves and their families. Um, and the other is to encourage production for the market and hence raise incomes. Of course, you can, you can do both. But the, um, the opportunities for doing both at the same time tend to vary a lot. Uh, between different parts of Africa, between different types of areas, between uh, peri-urban uh, areas connected to, to urban markets and, and areas in more marginal um, parts of, of countries, villages. Um, sorry. No, that's right. So <coughs> this is the starting point, and I'll, I'll be saying something about um, this on the basis of... Um, a project which I had, which is called the Afrint project. Uh, we've had two rounds of data collection in this, and we're um, setting up for the third round of data collection in, in a smaller number of, of countries than originally intended. But in 2002, the main um, research question was to, to look at the challenges of staple crop intensification. And staple crops are mainly, they're mainly roots and tubers and the grain crops which will be uh, basically um, what Africa needs to produce more of to be able to feed the growing cities and, and the growing rural population. And this was a comparative project that aimed to, to situate the possibilities for intensifying agriculture, especially in the food crop sector, compared with Asia. Um, and then in 2008, we carried up a follow-up on round one to gauge changes in the staple crop sector, what had happened, basically. And this project covers nine countries. Um, so Ethiopia, <coughs> Kenya, Uganda, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, Tanzania, uh, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and I'm missing one, Malawi. <coughs> um, and it's based in 20 different regions and around 100 villages. And there are 4,000 farm households that have been interviewed with through a questionnaire. Uh, 3,000 are still in the panel, so they've been interviewed in both 2002 and 2008. Uh, and importantly, the farm households are located uh, where the majority of people in Africa live, basically. So they, they capture sort of the smallholder, smallholder realities quite well. Um, <clears throat> and then, so what is the problem? As I said, at, at, at one level, it's a pragmatic problem, how, how to feed uh, a population that's basically shifting out of agriculture into, into other pursuits. And at one level, this, this problem is, is quite basic. Here is a list of yield gaps um, in the villages in question. And basically, the mean yields, as you'll see, they're, they're very low. By, by global standards, they're extremely low. And this shows, this is a cross-section, so it's not the panel households. So 
that sounds it's it's statistically representative for the villages but you'll see that for May the the mean yield has actually dropped from 2002 to 2008 <coughs> uh, and the potential yield or what what we've become interested in is uh, ah, we can't see the yield gap <laughs> We can only see it on my screen. Is there any way of, or you can see it over there, but not here. I think I've, I've been in this situation at CEDA before, actually, but <laughs> we could see half the screen. Well, anyway, as you'll see, <coughs> this is actually, this measures uh, the difference between uh, the 10% highest producers in the village, th their average production or average yield, compared to the rest. So as you'll see, the, the yield potential is, is quite large and it, it looks at, um, it sort of controls for, for village specific characteristics. Um, and that's what makes it interesting as a, as a measure of, of what could have, what could be accomplished. Um, and you'll see that for some, some crops like sorghum, the yield gap has actually widened. For most of them, it, it's, it sort of stayed the same more or less, it's quite stable. But at one level, this, this is the problem. <coughs> that uh, such a large proportion of, of smallholders are actually producing uh, below their capabilities or below what is actually possible in these places. And then one might ask then why? Why is this occurring? So one um, explanation can be found in, in the production dynamics with decreasing farm sizes being um, one example, especially in, in populous countries or in countries with fairly fast-growing populations with uh, a lack of very highly product productive land like Kenya. Um, there's also a very low use of fertilizer, low use of improved seed technology, uneven access to land, and gender-based discrimination generally in access to productive resources. And that's not only, that's not only technological uh, resources, but also things like uh, labor, which tends to be uh, underestimated, I think, in, in many discussions and, and seasonal aspects of access to labor. <coughs> so if we look at then the soil problem or the nutrient problem, um, soils are severely depleted, especially in densely populated areas. And this is a map of, <coughs> and I'm, I'm not a soil expert, <laughs> so I'll, I'll um, um, but this is, it's an illustration of, of annual nutrient depletion occurring, especially in, in densely populated areas. I mentioned Kenya earlier, uh, Tanzania and Ethiopia are also here. Um, and at the same time, Sub-Saharan Africa in global terms is an extremely small user of fertilizer, uh, while unequal access to fertilizer uh, is, project is projected to continue at the, at the global level. Um, oh, something happened. Uh, <coughs> So here we see uh, developed countries, and this is a map from IFPRI that compares Sub-Saharan Africa to, to the rest of the world, basically. Um, and so at, at one level, the lack of, of inputs is, is a very real <laughs> problem in many parts of, of rural Af Africa. And this is, of course, related to, um, well, to expenditures, um, but also to, to sheer availability and timing. Um, so Malawi has become famous for its fertilizer subsidy program, but at the same time, there are severe problems with timing issues and seasonality um, in relation to, to accessing fertilizers. So there, there are lots of, of different aspects to this fertilizer dilemma. But there are also market-related explanations for this. So if, if we look at these households, approximately half of the staple crop producers sell something. Um, and whereas the share of non-commercialized farmers, that is farmers that don't actually sell anything, has actually increased uh, between 2002 and 2008. And more maize is, but less sorghum is being sold if we look at the average amounts marketed among those households that do sell. But basically, staple crop amounts sold remain very low. Um, five minutes. <laughs> um, and then we have. Uh, perhaps I should skip this and go on to the to the because I I yeah. 
but it it will explain what I ha I have to say. But basically, this the situation is connected to the smallholder producer consumer. Uh, so smallholders are both producers and consumers, most of them. Uh, expensive inputs and low producer prices makes life difficult. And they have livelihoods that are prone to seasonality and extreme weather events, uh, but also to markets and shifts in markets. So hedging bets outside agriculture to avoid seasonal shifts through dispersing labor becomes uh, a strategy of, of getting by, basically. Which means that division of labor over time and space is crucial. And this has also re resulted in the development of multispatial consumption systems where you have urban households being fed by rural relatives. So the smallholders are having their food security stretched in lots of different ways, which also have to do with demography. And this has resulted or results often in a vicious cycle of poor producer and consumer confidence in the market as a provider of food, both in urban and rural areas. Um, and then I'll just skip this. <laughs> I'll skip this and I'll get to this um, revisiting the, the seven recommendations from the Commission. And this is just a mental note, so I won't actually talk about them in detail. But I'll, s I'll say something, and I think many of the points have already been raised by the audience. Um, but I think one, one aspect, and, and I'd like to stress, I think this, this smallholder emphasis is a very good thing in this, this report. But um, one aspect that I think is missing is this connection to uh, non-food systems. So basically, um, policies and strategies have different consequences in different places. Um, and that the effects of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the developed world may indirectly affect food security in developing countries. I think this, this whole issue of discussing inequalities in the global food system could have been applied also to other types of inequalities outside the global food system. Um, and in that sense, links between developing and developed countries may actually lie outside the food system and still affect the foods, food security in, in the developing world. And one example is the energy food nexus and how the competition over coarse grains as uh, feedstocks for biofuels on the one hand, um, animal feed on the other hand, and finally as human food, um, have very strong effects and, and interplay with one another and um, affect farmers and smallholders and also the urban poor. And I don't think that's, I couldn't find it <laughs> in the report. I read, I read the final report also. Um, and then countries are tied together both directly and indirectly through trade links, for instance. This issue was raised earlier. Um, also what I, I couldn't find was this reference to large scale land acquisitions that um, uh, Brian raised earlier, um, and where you could potentially have a situation of pitching the food security of the poor against food security of the non-poor, and, and I'm also missing that discussion of how, how is that to be handled. <coughs> so I think that issues of global governance that could, could have been specified is, on the one hand, how to redress institutional in inequalities in the global system of agricultural trade, on the one hand, given the emergence, of, emergence of, of the BRICS as major players in global food markets um, and, also, and also in developing countries in themselves. We find Brazil entering the markets, for instance, in, in West and Southern Africa with, with these effects of, of, well, indirect effects at least, of, of dumping food prices. And how, how do we handle that? And how does that affect food security among these countries? Then another issue that I looked for in vain, I think, or there's a few references, is how to manage processes of private sector food retailing uh, expansion and the whole process of supermarketization. Not so much supermarketization here, which is also an issue, and, and how standards and, and um, private sector standards potentially lock uh, smallholders out of of markets in, in European countries or in the US, but also how, I, how is supermarketization in staple crops, in grain crops, in developing countries affecting smallholders as producers of food and also consumers? Because there is this, this um, um, 
side of, of the supermarketization uh, process in uh, yeah, Kenya or uh, Tanzania, Uganda, where South African um, supermarkets are entering the markets uh, quite strongly for, for maize, especially. Um, and then how to ensure that climate policy, especially in relation to energy and the developed world, does not jeopardize food security in the developing world. So not so much taking uh, climate change as a given, but how do and how to handle it in, in practice on, on the ground. But um, how, how does the developed world come up with a responsible climate policy in the sense of not jeopardizing or um, uh, making sort of food insecurity worse? Because here it's assumed that climate change itself will do that which I think is, is fair enough, but there are also policies of dealing with climate change that may affect smallholder realities. And then I think returning again to the issue of civil society and how to engage regional and glo or global initiatives outside the donor sector specifically. So for instance, AGRA or the Gates Foundation, um, uh, farmers organizations, and, and sort of the strategies for doing that. And perhaps that's the next step. It's, sort of what, what will come after the recommendation. Um, and then I think just summing up here with consequences for smallholders in, in sub-Saharan Africa of the proposed recommendation. I think consequences very greatly depend on, again on how they're operationalized. And I'll return to this issue of recommendation three and the whole um, agroecological, because I agree with you, it has that slant towards agroecology. And I think one example is recommendation three. How will that be operationalized? Now, that will have consequences, for instance, in terms of complexities of labor use. If you shift towards uh, very labor intensive uh, strategies of agricultural production, uh, that shift or, or that increase in, in labor intensity for the household as a whole uh, will tend to fall <laughs> on women within the households and add to, to already labor-intense lives, basically. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, dealt with. How, how do we ensure that this does not actually um, uh, pose undue labor demands and, and affect the seasonal aspects of, of already uh, vulnerable livelihoods? Uh, <clears throat> also, I think the links to the non-farm sector, again, especially in, among women who have smaller opportunities in agriculture, need to be considered. Um, how, how are they to be dealt with? Um, I would also say that many of the recommendations in one sense have a one-size-fits-all point of departure. And in, in one way, I guess that's, that's natural if you have recommendations of this character. Uh, but the, the um, references to technology, I think, are... are one example of refrigeration technology, for instance, uh, where you have, where in, in many areas, refrigeration is just out of the question. I mean, I think the emphasis in, in many areas need to be on extremely low tech level. Um, then the issue of community-based initiatives um, tend to have their own problems, and this has been tried and tried and tried in uh, decentralization agendas of different kinds, um, tied uh, to different types of political decentralization that uh, again tend to be, um, need to, to be critically assessed before they're sort of launched because they carry their own problems of internal democracy and so on and also of, uh, again, gender roles, and, um, political and, and equity problems. And I think that uh, the potential politicization of some of the initiatives that are mentioned need to be carefully dealt with. Um, Ethiopia was mentioned earlier, um, but Ethiopia has quite a few political problems also. Um, uh, fertilizer subsidies are mentioned, and I think that's I mean, it's again, it's fair enough to, and I think that's it's it's uh, a good thing that fertilizer is being recognized. It's something that's necessary, but um, some they do carry issues of of uh, politics also that are are sometimes are not present really in the. 
I don't think I, I went past five minutes. It was I? fascinating. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay. Are you yes, winding up? Very good. Thank you very much. Um, stay. Don't go anywhere. Okay. I'm sure that, that we'll have some comments on, on your uh, excellent discussion. Um, I know your research already, so I won't comment on that. I thought it was uh, just one sort of overarching question I'd like to ask you before I open it up. And then when you looked at these... Uh, the different things that were missing and the negative, con small things like global governance, land grabbing, food versus fuel, and the negative consequences for <coughs> smallholder agriculture. I wonder how you look at these recommendations as a whole. Do you think they're useful? Do they move things forward? Or, or, or do you think it, it's just another list of wish list from international... I think they're trying to do everything at one time. I mean, in that sense, they're, they're not dealing with the difficult question. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's, that's uh, um, so they're not, I mean, I think the difficult questions are, are sort of the institutional is inequalities in, in the different types of global systems. I think what they do, which is, is good, is deal with the consumption production aspect of the food system. But they're not dealing with world trade, essentially. I mean, there's a few references to, to trade. They're not dealing with... Um, energy no. versus food and so mm -hmm. um so i think that would be and i think they're um they're general i mean that and that's also point part of the character of this type of report yeah. mm -hmm. so um but i think they need to be dealt with much more specifically in terms of, of different countries different types if if i'd had more time i would have said something about the differences between central kenya and northern ghana for instance and and smallholder realities in in different places in terms of of what types of policies are relevant um and i think this uh this needs to be if it, if it is to be operationalized at the country level it needs to be thought out very carefully in terms of a, a strategy of some sort mm -hmm. okay Thank you, um, and thank you for indulging me and letting me get a question. Uh, please, from the audience, Ngolia. Okay. Very bright. <laughs> Can I behind you? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, thank you very much, Agnes, for an excellent uh, presentation. My question is, you mentioned that one of the important factors is actually how you influence policy making in these countries that you carry out most of your panel data research. I wonder how does your, your own research feed into the policy making in the various countries that you are doing research? And have you seen any impact of, for instance, taking up some of your recommendations? I think um, for the second round we had uh, the CADEP, um, or sorry, yes, the CADEP representative from NEPAD was part of our advisory group, but that was in 2008. Uh, and as we know, quite a lot has happened since since then. What we see, um, I don't know if it's been taken up concretely as such. I know there was uh, our Nigerian counterpart uh, wrote something that was used as a political level, as far as I know. But what we've tried to do is look at the influence of policy in terms of of can we see an outcome in in um, in the livelihoods, basically, or in in production levels, or fertilizer uptake and that sort of thing. Um, and we've looked at, at different types of, of connections and we, d we can't really find any evidence of this actually hitting sort of the smallholder sector. But I think it's, qu it's too early to evaluate. I, I think that would be at the macro level, um, the, um, the uh, budget allocations to agriculture have been increasing. Uh, we can sort of see examples if you drive around you can see things being built and, and initiatives being taken and so on but among among the households that we um, interview we haven't we haven't seen any um, real changes in that sense and I think it um, as I mentioned we'll be collecting data in 2013 uh, in four countries uh, Malawi Zambia Kenya and Ghana um, and my guess would be that we would probably see a bit more by now than five years ago or f four years ago. So at least we can hope so. <laughs> um, but other than that, I think our, our policy discussions have been mainly with SIDA, um, so much directly with. 
And then I know that our, our African counterparts, so in, in Malawi, for instance, we're going to present our results in, uh, at the ministry in uh, October. So, I mean, they, they do a, a fair bit of sort of presenting of, of results um, uh, to their country ministry. But we haven't done that as, as sort of the Swedish research. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions or comments? <laughs> Microphone, please. Yeah, <laughs> then I cannot miss. No. <laughs> uh, we have seen this uh, diagram on fertilizers utilization in different regions of the world, and definitely the industrialized world largest consumer mm. of fertilizer and the South African increase 4.2 there uh, considering this uh, uh, the clean development mechanism shouldn't we the pay the developing countries for the use of fertilizers we have to, to compensate the use they don't have <laughs> good luck Agnes <laughs> <laughs> this is a <laughs> this is stump government <laughs> go ahead I'm not sure that was a question. I think uh -huh. that was a comment. Oh, it was a comment. <laughs> oh, that's a way well, out. Oh, that's a very good. Okay, yeah. uh, that's very <laughs> difficult. Sorry, on sustainable ag agriculture, and uh, what is sustainability? Is it sustainable to use this kind of fertilizers or not, mm -hmm. and so on? It is more related to that. I because don't know. We could say that it is uh, what we do in the developing world is not sustainable in that regard. I mean, it, only that. And this is more sustainable. What they, they, do, they do, what they don't use. Of course, they are paying with this uh, hunger and this starving and uh, that they are not using. Yeah. This I is my does, conception. Yeah, I understand your question. Does anyone from the commission want to respond to that? No, I think uh, the general way of looking at it in the debate, if you let me hop in here yes. to save you, <laughs> is that, that we overuse it and they underuse it. But the fact that we overuse it doesn't give us the moral right to tell them they can't mm -hmm. use it at all. I think that's sort of the political discussion that's going on about fertilizer. But then, of course, it gets much more complicated when it becomes subsidized fertilizer. Then you start asking other questions. Okay, uh, more comments. Questions. Do we have any uh, from the cyberspace here? Okay, good. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just um, elaborate a little bit more about the links between um, urban and rural food security. Talked about in the is that your question or is the cyber? No, it's, it's been <laughs> <laughs> retweeted several okay. times. Okay, I was just wondering if you, uh, if you'd like to um, to detail this a little more, or should I just say something briefly about the links? I don't think that would okay. so quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the links between urban and rural food uh, systems. Um, if we look at our data, and this was um, done only for the 2008 data, we added a set of questions on transfers of food between, or actually from the rural households rather than to urban households, because we don't have data from the urban. Um, and it turned out that about 40% of the households that grow maize, and we looked at, at the staple crops because they're easier to transfer, actually send food to relatives that are not living with them in, um, in the villages. So we have large amounts of food that are actually leaving the rural homesteads being eaten somewhere else. Um, if I remember correctly about uh, and it's, it's not possible to specify by volume how much goes to the urban areas, how much goes to other rural areas. But something like 50% of the respondents said, well, we're sending food to the rural area, or sorry, to the urban area. Um, and the point there is that, uh, and what uh, I've looked at, the, at who sends this food. You'd expect it perhaps to be the, the very rich households who do have a surplus would be able to send some food to other relatives. But it's actually, a, it's throughout uh, the sample. It's regardless of, of income. And uh, the most vulnerable um, households actually, in relative terms, send as much as the richest household. So you have a situation of, of basically the family stretching outside 
the village. Um, so whatever is produced is, is used to feed family members outside the village. And that, of course, has implications. If you design something like a, a, a vulnerable, like this program in Ethiopia, the um, safety net uh, program, um, if your intention is to target the very vulnerable households, if you can't see these transfers, how would you know who to target? So these transfers, unless you collect data on them in the way we've done, they're invisible um, and they fall outside the market market sort of mechanism and still they're a very important uh, um, part of of the food system for the urban areas and for other areas for for more vulnerable rural areas so they have they have implications for the sending households in terms of food security that are not not visible unless you ask specifically about it. and if you probe sort of qualitatively um, if you ask uh, the farmers well um, they will just say, well, this is part of our household consumption. My household isn't here. And this is a, an old debate in, in studies. Well, where is the household exactly? But, but uh, they sort of perceive it as part of, of the consumption burden of, of the household. But it's, it's being spread across space. Um, Wrap up yeah. this and, yeah, and move on. Do you have any more comments that have been retweeted? I like that word. That, that was the main one. Right? That was the main yeah. one. Okay. 